anyway, welcome to the American Institute of Philosophical and Cultural Thought. Um, there is boisterous hilarity in the room. It's in an excellent mood, and uh, that's a good thing. This is going to be our first annual William S. Minor Dissertation Fellowship Lecture, and so I want to call up uh, the Executive Director of the Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity to tell you about uh, the organization a little bit and also uh, to introduce our speaker. Corey McCall is that Executive Director of Elmira College, where he teaches and um, keeps company with Mark Twain's study. All right. Thank you, Randy. Um, as Randy mentioned, I am the executive director of the Foundation for Philosophy and Creativity. Um, and the goal of the organization is to nurture work in creativity broadly construed in philosophy and other fields. And so to that end, last year, we actually, almost exactly a year ago today, um, we got together, uh, the board, and decided, you know, what are some other things we can do to nurture work and creativity? And one of the things we decided to do was um, sponsor a dissertation fellowship. And the fruit of that decision to sponsor the fellowship, uh, we're going to hear that today. Um, Jen Morrow is our first uh, dissertation fellow. So she's been here working on uh, her project, her dissertation, um, for the past eight weeks. And her lecture today is the result of that, um, entitled Humor's Interpretation. Uh, Jen Mara is going to talk to us about Kassir and humor, I believe. Um, Jen Mara is a PhD candidate at Marquette University and a great human being. So please join me in welcoming Jen Mara. So obviously I'd like to thank Corey and the AIPC team, the Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity, uh, John Shook for, among other things, hauling my comically large suitcase around the train station in Carbondale, uh, Myron Jackson for lifting me out of an impossible hole I wrote myself into, Mark McCoy for his friendship, and of course Randy and Gay Oxer for welcoming in, me into their home. Um, I came here completely sure that I just needed to throw my dissertation project out and start over, retreat back into the safety of Kantian metaphysics. Um, while I stand before you today with more faith in the project, I really look forward to workshopping this with you. What I'm presenting today is uh, very much a marathon of the first 160 pages of the dissertation up to the brick wall that I have faced, which is the final chapter. Um, and it is very much still a work in progress, but I feel like I have a direction now that I didn't have before um, as a result of being here and having access to all these wonderful books, as well as just a, a perfect space for the sort of writing and creativity that I needed to, to help me out with this. Um, so a little bit of background. Uh, my undergraduate education was almost entirely paid for through Pell Grants. We never really had any money. I'm, one of six kids and I was the only one that graduated high school. So education wasn't really something that, uh, that was, was considered the obvious thing to do, right? So um, what I did when I was a kid was I spent a lot of time uh, burying myself in schoolwork because it was something that I can control among a lot, amongst a lot of chaos and also staying up really late to watch Conan and Saturday Night Live on an old black and white television that I bought from a dead woman's estate sale with babysitting money. So my approach to um, professional philosophy was a little bit different than um, my colleagues. Um, I started graduate school as a master's student in Marquette in 2011, and I focused my research on Kant, both because I found the fine way that his complicated puzzle pieces fit together to be extremely gratifying and because I knew that if I could do first critique Kant, then I would certainly not have any issues with people taking me seriously. And now I do humor. Um, after, so the, what got me into humor was a, I saw a call for papers for a group called the Lighthearted Philosopher Society, and the call was asking for papers on the philosophy of humor or humorous papers on philosophy. And I didn't know that either of those things existed. 
Um, but I was very intrigued by it, and I wrote my first uh, paper about philosophy of humor for, with the encouragement of my pragmatism professor, Stanley Harrison, and I wrote on James and humor, and I have not looked back since. Um, the central problem of my dissertation concerns the philosophy of humor, and there's, there's a couple of problems with the contemporary landscape of philosophy of humor. Um, the first one is that there aren't a lot of people who start their research in philosophy of humor as a junior scholar. It's usually something that you do once you're older and tenured and established and want to have fun. So uh, this, the, the research tends to be either a little superficial or a little disconnected from the sorts of cultural enterprises and, and artifacts that we see today. Um, a lot of reference to, to like Charlie Chaplin, but no references to any contemporary comedians that like the kids like. Um, so, so that's part of the problem. And another problem is that there's this uh, debate concerning what humor is, right? And there's these analytic definitions that come down that are either too broad or too narrow, and what happens is you get people in one camp who are saying, well, humor is just something that we can't define, and so therefore we're not gonna try. We're just gonna have fun with it instead. Then the other camp we have uh, takes on something that's closer to uh, some version of an incongruity theory of humor, which is basically saying something like, um, well, the reason that I find this funny is because there's something unexpected going on that I didn't, that, uh, I didn't see coming or something incongruous, something absurd, something that doesn't fit. Right? Um, I don't belong to either camp. I think that the incongruity leaves a lot of things out. For one, the reason that this is funny is because it's true not because there's something that we don't expect. Any of us who are in, <laughs> who are philosophers amongst non-philosophers tend to be this guy, right? Um, so, so there's something in the incongruity theory that I think is missing. And there's also something about uh, these incongruity theories that don't understand or don't uh, give due appreciation for the way that humor actually works and how important humor is in our lives. So we have you know, humor as somehow this kind of universal thing that we can't get rid of. And it is absolutely universal in terms of all time, all people, all places. Um, we seem to be addicted to it in some way, right? We're participants in it from the time that we're infants and we're playing peeky boo up until we're on our deathbeds. And we create and consume it, right? Uh, anthropologically, um, we've seen humor existing and being created under really severe survival conditions like in, concentra in concentration camps. There's also been evidence of humor in cave paintings. There's obviously humor on Greek pottery. Anytime you see a Greek pot where there's just a guy with a giant phallus, that's the guy that represents the Joker. Um, some things carry through. Um, it's created and sustained in this oral, written, and media tradition. There's not like one specific method to comedy and to humor. We use it as a social gauge. If I tell you a joke and you laugh at it, I'm I, the way that you respond to that joke is gonna give is gonna tell me something about you and your character, right? Uh, it creates the in and out groups, and we use it publicly and privately. Um, so what is it? There's a couple of different theories of humor. The classic ones are superiority theories that come from Plato and Hobbes, the, and then we have relief and relaxation theories, which are more psychological theories with Freud, and then we get these contemporary theories that are all kind of incongruent, incongruity theories in one way or another. So a superiority theory, right? We're going to watch Afro Ninja. Were you able to hear uh, the commentary in the background of that? So this is one of those bits that I, it's, it's unintentional. Um, it, I think it gets funnier as you watch the video because not only does he fail and then he tries and ends up, you know, his body gives up on him, but then you hear the people around him like, dude, don't get up, don't get up, just stay down. Um, 
<laughs> so, so the superiority theory would say that, well, the reason that we're laughing at that is because we feel better than this person, right? We feel superior to him. It's the same reason that we watch the first couple episodes of American Idol when they do the failed auditions is because, you know, like, well, I might not be able to sing, but at least I know that I can't sing, right? And so therefore I can look at these people and I feel better than them and that's what makes us laugh. A relief or a relaxation theory is going to say that the reason that I'm laughing is because when I, when I confront the world, it's an awful, terrible world full of a lot of tension and, and horrible stuff and I need to get relief or relax from that, either psychologically or as Freud would say, it's because we have sexual and aggressive energy and we need to get it out. So laughter is, just provides us something to get out that energy in a more socially constructive way than Freud thinks that energy really needs to come out. So we're laughing at that guy just because we're in here boiling over with aggressive and sexual energy. Of course, this is an unfalsifiable theory, but uh, it also doesn't even really tell us about humor. It's just telling us about laughter. It's telling us about physiology. Um, contemporary theories, incongruity theory, I talked about a little bit. A belief-based epistemological theory is sort of the same thing. When we watch Afro Ninja, we expect one thing to happen, and we have associated belief sets about that thing. Stay down. Um, so we have all of these belief sets about what's going to happen and we start to flicker between the belief set of what we think is going to happen and then what did happen and we go back and forth. So it gets funnier and funnier according to this because we're flickering back and forth between these two belief sets. The benign violation theory is also similar and it says that in order for something to be funny it needs to be violating some sort of social norm in some way. But it also needs to be benign enough that it's still funny and not traumatic, right? And so where those, that Venn diagram comes together, that's the sweet spot of humor. So the reason that this is funny is because we don't think that the guy's really hurt. If he was really hurt, the benign violation theorists are going to say that we're going to stop laughing, right? Um, there are counterexamples to that. But also, this is another one of those theories that tells us a lot about kind of social norms that govern why we would find something benign, why we de would define something as violating, but it doesn't tell us much about humor or the way it's operating. Evolutionary theory is uh, one of Dennett's uh, latest things. He teamed up with two other guys uh, named Hurley and Adams, and uh, they traced humor back to an, evolu an evolutionary function that was meant to stop us from dying. So if I'm running after a saber-toothed tiger and he jumps over a cliff and I go to follow him, we need to have some sort of competing epistemic mechanism that basically pumps the brake so that we don't go over the cliff. And whatever that mechanism is, it has to be very pleasurable in order to compete with all the other stimuli that we're receiving. So we laugh at the saber -tooth. So we don't laugh at the saber-toothed tiger. Originally, we got some sort of like joyous pleasure that would stop us in our tracks, and then that evolved into a sense of humor. Are you sure they weren't kidding? No. <laughs> no. So you could see, you could see why I have issues with these theories, right? What I think humor is is what Kassira calls a symbolic form. And a symbolic form, it's a, it's a difficult thing to, um, to kind of cash out. But those of you who are philosophers and are familiar with uh, Kant's critique of pure reason, what Kant did in the critique of pure reason, Kassira says, is he outlined one symbolic form of culture. And that was science and reason. But Kassira says that's not the full story, right? Human, human life is so much more than just science and reason. So he wanted to create critiques of other forms of culture. So he names art and language and myth as some of those forms. So I'm going to skip over some of these quotes that support my controversial thesis that humor is a symbolic form, but they are there and they're beautiful and I'm right. Um, uh, but I have a lot of textual evidence. Um, the, what I'm really interested in when it comes to humor and looking at it as a symbolic form is what happens when humor is used 
as a handmaid to something like myth. So we can see this politically, we can see this in middle school, when humor is used to forward some sort of ideology that is harmful or um, oppressive to an individual or a group. Um, this is a quote about myth. The way that I think that humor functions is actually specifically to disrupt what the sort of epistemic viciousness that you have to have in order to believe the myth, all right? So the, the way I get there is basically what, you know, what is the commonality of all of these different theories of humor, which I think are approaching the question from within all these different forms of culture and giving answers that satisfy them, but they never give us the whole picture because they're not approaching humor as its own form, right? So the one thing that they have in common is that there's some sort of revelatory function going on in humor. And I think that that is the cultural function of humor. I think it's specific to the form of humor, and I think that it's necessary to the form of humor in ways that it can appear in other forms, but it's accidental to those forms, whereas I feel like it's necessary, and I argue that it's necessary for humor. Um, so when I use the language of epistemic viciousness, I'm talking about laziness, arrogance, and closed-mindedness. I follow Jose Medina here in his epistemology of resistance. Um, and this is how he describes uh, epistemic vices. And if you read this bit from his book, it sounds like he's describing someone that we are dealing with right now politically um, in some kind of uh, cathartic ways. I suggest reading that alongside A Myth of the State by Kassir, and it's, it's, uh, it's cathartic. So these vices are not just things that we get ourselves into or, or little, ha little uh, things that we say or do. They're habitual. They're things that are ingrained. It's the way that we think. That's what makes them epistemically vicious. Um, it prevents learning from happening. It prevents learning from, ta from taking place. If you're too lazy to find out the answer to a question or to investigate the answer, you're not gonna learn. If you're too arrogant to bother to ask the question, then you're not gonna learn. If you're too close-minded to be open to the views or perspectives of, perspectives of others, you're not gonna learn, right? So all of these things are, um, are what you need to do in order to kind of like swallow the pill that you're being fed through uh, these harmful mythologies. So even if you don't agree with me that humor is a symbolic form, I feel like whatever humor is, this is what it does. This is how it functions. Um, here's a bunch of quotes uh, about why we need to be careful about myth. Kassira is very clear that the symbolic forms are forms that need to remain as a plurality. Um, this is an, an interpretational um, disagreement I have with some other Kassir scholars. I think it's clear as day um, that, that he uh, is very concerned with maintaining the equilibrium of the forms. And what I mean by that is you get someone who's a scientist and someone who's religious. And they start talking to each other. And they're always going to talk past each other. Because the scientific person is operating under different criteria for what counts as true than the religious person, right? And insofar as they don't share some sort of common criteria or understanding of what counts as true, they're always going to talk past each other, right? The only way for the scientist to really truly understand the religious person is to understand the criteria of the religious person and vice versa, right? Not to say that one is better or more superior to the other, simply that you can look at the same object from one perspective and another, and each perspective gives you an equal but new understanding and interpretation of that object. And if you want the full story of that object, you have to get as many of those interpretations as possible. So the scientist misses something that's true about the world if he doesn't understand religion as religion ought to be understood. And the religious person misses something about the world if they refuse the criteria of science, right? So what Kassira talks about in particular is a, is a political hijacking of myth, right? When you have, when you have mythologies uh, that were present in Russian Bolshevism, I can never say that word, and in Nazi Germany, you end up with, for example, science acting as the handmaiden of a myth. What we have there is a race myth, we have a, risk, uh, a myth of a superior uh, Aryan race. 
And so what they do, they said, okay, scientists, here's, here's what we have. I want you to do experiments to prove this thing. So the way that science ought to proceed is science asks a question and then goes and finds out the answer without the answer already in mind. But when science is working for myths, for example, science is, has the answer to the question and is finding evidence to support it, right? It's a confirmation bias. Um, and this is harmful, right? So this is uh, Fabian Capieres. He says, if myth and expression can be wonderful elements of art, religion, or language, they are a major threat when they invade politics and reign over other cultural forms, right? So um, here are just some old examples of that, right? We have uh, anti-Japanese propaganda and anti-suffrage propaganda. Um, you'll have to come up and read this one later because it's actually hysterical. Um, they didn't mean it to be so, but... Um, but the ways in which we cash people out in language matters, right? Um, the names that we call people, the way that we, that we uh, categorize people through humor matters. And when, it's, when humor is hijacked by a political mythology, then humor has the same good powers, right, that it did before, but it's being used under the umbrella of this bad end. Right, so just like science became the handmaiden to myth, humor can become the handmaiden to myth too. Um, I have not as much time as I wanted left because I get very excited. But um, what I want to do is my final chapter was dealing with stuff like this. Right, this is a uh, meme that was on a website called a Facebook page called Cop Humor. And I'm particularly concerned with this sort of humor because the, one of the other things that I do in my program is uh, team up with uh, a colleague of mine, Marisola Jalili, who started this program called Eat It, where we go and we teach in prisons. And this is, it doesn't look like it on the surface, but this is a race myth, right, in action. It's the, uh, the whole, the joke is that one woman will have a bunch of baby daddies that are in prison and have a bunch of kids, and the, uh, the implication is that, you know, the welfare queen terminology, uh, you just have these children so that you can get government money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, now, how can I make some sort of objective statement about the morality or the ethics of a meme like this, right? This is what I've been struggling with in my dissertation, is at the end of the day, what, what do we get out of thinking of humor as a symbolic form? Well, I think that there's an embedded normativity in Kassir's philosophy of symbolic forms that comes from the insistence on the plurality of the forms. So if that's the case, and thinking of humor in this way allows me to pull out right, the, the function, the symbolic function of the form, um, and see the normative edge of that function. And if I can put that all together with the grand scheme of what Kassir says culture is, which is ultimately a struggle towards some sort of ideal freedom, and it's a struggle, not a progress. He's not saying that we ever go straight there, right? It's a struggle. Our personal interests get in the way. Um, so we're always just trying to get better and sometimes we screw it up, right? So how can I use this whole system that Kassir has given me to be able to make an objective statement about the morality of a meme like this? Because subjectively, I look at this and it makes me upset, right? And it, it could be because of my socio-political leanings. People are going to say, oh, it's just a joke. You're being too sensitive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How can we get beyond the it's just a joke thing, right? Because humor is often just an excuse to be an asshole. So if humor is part of this cultural system that Kassira offers us, and that cultural system is aiming for an ideal of liberation, we see how that is obstructed by things like political myth. Right? We see how political mythologies, race myths in particular, are used to um, dehumanize people, to put them in different places. But we also don't want to get 
on you know the other side of it right we also don't want to get to a point where we are going to the cop humor facebook page and saying this shouldn't be allowed right so what we don't want to do is build up the same walls culturally about what's allowed and what's not allowed but under the new system of well we're imprisoning for the sake of liberating right so the struggle is how do i make a judgment that this is um, against Kassir's idea of culture or this is counter to the philosophy of symbolic forms and the function of humor. Well, I can look at this and I can know what I know about the history of prisons, right? And I can say that this is actually encouraging epistemic viciousness, not disrupting it, right? It's, um, and I had some other memes on here. They were just real rough. Oh, I still have them. So here's some other ones. Uh, from the same website, right? Um, so these are people who work in law enforcement and their jobs are very difficult. And I know anecdotally from family gatherings and from my firsthand experience working in prison that this sort of humor is not only tolerated, but it's encouraged and produced by the superiors that work in the prison system, right? And so, and well, why, they, why? Well, it's obvious, right? Prisons were built as, as microcosms of control, right? The whole idea is to take whatever person that you have deemed as a criminal and put them under control in some sort of way. Foucault teaches us all about how initially this started off as a punishment of the body and it transformed into a punishment of the mind, right? Um, and so you have some, you have these representations of people who, you know, are anti-Trump for example. For, for example, people who are who are fighting back against the, the mythologies, right? And you have one of them as someone who's uh, mentally challenged, and you have someone else who's in a straitjacket, right? So the whole idea is that is, is this craziness, right? It's how do we dismiss the people who are bringing up that there's a problem while we make fun of them, okay? Now, I again, the, these ones are really rough. I do not like these at all. Um, yes, that's okay. Whoopi Goldberg. It makes me extremely upset. At the same time, I don't want to say this shouldn't be allowed, right? I don't want the same sort of silencing that happens um, with, you know, extreme example, the silencing that the Nazis did to be an, the same sort of silencing or at least a silencing that ends up in a similar place, but towards a different end, right? Um, so this has been the struggle. And the way that I've uh, been trying to work through it is through this guy, Hans, I don't even know how to say his name because I just found out about him once I got here. Hans Weihinger. <laughs> Philosophy is as, of, as if. And Kwame Anthony Appiah wrote a book just recently that's a study of this text about ideals and idealization. And it's right in line with what Kassir is saying, right? We can't help but idealize. We're always reaching for an ideal. And what uh, Wagner gives us is this kind of brilliant way to begin to answer the objective ethical question, which is to what end is this ideal appropriate, right? What ideal in a normative sense are we presenting or are we positing or are we using in the humor or in the joke or in the meme, right? I feel like given that Kassira gives us an ideal end that we should be aiming for, that can help us kind of visualize where we ought to be going. But how we get there, of course, is gonna be a struggle. So I feel like, um, and, and I was introduced to this text actually through Myron Jackson and that's when I was, you know, and I was like, oh my gosh, I think I might, I think I might be, be able to get onto something with this chapter. It's not finished yet. Um, I don't quite know where to go from here um, in terms of where I think it could take us, but what we do in a practical sense about it. So I can objectively, if I use what Kassira tells us about idealizations, then I ask the to what end question, I can say objectively that this is wrong, right? In a normative sense. What we do about it is still an open question. I don't know. 
I don't know. Because there's a danger of overcorrection that I think we should avoid. Now, that was a lot of heavy stuff, so I just want to end with a 15 second video that I like to show my students before they take an exam. Um, because studies show that when you um, engage in humor before you take an exam or before you study, it actually increases your creativity and uh, problem solving abilities. Show it to you guys so you can problem solve my dissertation. struggling way that I put it. Okay, there's the dangerous part. Um, so what I have here is, all right, so that, um, I don't wanna put it on it. So this one, right. Um, to what end is this humor presented? Ultimately, it's to the end of epistemic viciousness. For this is the way to maintain order and control in a prison environment. And I focused on the prison environment because that's what I have the most experience with. I don't want to subscribe it to all law enforcement. I've seen the most concentrated versions of this humor in a prison environment. Even though that's a cop website, uh, I, I just I don't feel like I have the evidence to, to say that this is with that throughout law enforcement, but um, anecdotally, I think that there's evidence for that. Um, so the end is an ideal of complacency, blindness, acceptance of established rules and roles in a world in which questioning authority makes one hostile and weak. Curiosity, open-mindedness, and humility are mocked. This is not precisely contrary to human, or this is precisely contrary to human's function and furthermore is an instantiation of humor that takes us away from culture's ideal of the liberation of humanity and which is precisely what Casiris warned us about. So what should we do about it? Should we get into the comment thread arguments with the administrator? Should we avoid direct confrontation and demand the page be taken down? Do we start an internet campaign to get law enforcement who follow the page fired? I don't think that's the answer. Whether we're on the right side of history or not, it's dangerous to dictate what is and what is not allowed in creative production. Culture is the struggle towards freedom not a progression, but a struggle, and in our desperation to force society back on track, we have been overcorrecting, building the same walls, only ours are made up of the moral high ground. So what should we do? I don't know, but at least we know that what we're seeing is wrong. What I do know is that we don't want myth to take over using science and humor as handmaidens, but we don't want humor to take over either, and we don't want to imprison for the sake of liberation. We need to hold each other accountable. It's just a joke as a calling card of the coward. Ultimately, it comes down to this. You can tell a lot about a culture by what it finds funny. And is this what we want people to define us with? Is this the end that we posit for ourselves? So it's, um, I was talking with Pete about this earlier today. And, you know, so you have situations where um, speakers are chased off of the campus, they're not allowed to speak on campus, and I, I think that's dangerous. I think that the, um, I think that preventing people from being able to speak is a bad road. And who makes the decision and who makes the cuts for who's allowed and who's not is a, is a dangerous road. Instead, that what I think we should do is we should have our Ben Shapiro, right, in a debate with the not Ben Shapiro, 
right? Don't just have someone that you think is, is spouting dangerous ideologies have the mic and have it, you know, be able to say what they want without being held accountable. Invite them, but also invite the other person and have a debate. And that's the way that we're going to teach our students how to deal with this stuff in the real world. Not by saying, well, you're not allowed to say that. I think that that's really dangerous. And I, and, um, I kind of, it's not often that I agree with Mill, but I agree with Mill when he's talking about the liberty of expression, about how we can learn something just as powerful from what's wrong, from a wrong idea as we can from a correct idea. So that's, that's kind of what I mean, is what I don't want to do is fall into the tyranny of silencing. Um, have you for the better cause, right? Have you considered <clears throat> the balance between what Kassira calls progressive uh, uh, versus conservative symbolic forms of culture? Mm -hmm. um, because it strikes me that along with art, um, I would be inclined to interpret comedy and tragedy both uh, under the general heading of art, but he says that it's a progressive Mm -hmm. um, uh, symbolic form of culture, and we might even go further and say transgressive, um, <clears throat> but that doesn't mean that it doesn't have, uh, that it doesn't have like retrograde, <laughs> I mean just because its general function in mm -hmm. culture pushes us out of whatever's comfortable right. uh, and whatever's acceptable doesn't mean that it doesn't have its back end, mm -hmm. and it would be the same. He says science is a progressive symbolic form of culture, mm -hmm. I disagree as you know. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but but I certainly agree that language is, and language and art taken together um, uh, strike me as 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 the, 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 the at least the materials of comedy. Mm -hmm. I don't know about humor. Humor is a much more general category. Right. I would agree that that comedy can be considered, or can, comedy can be artfully done. Mm -hmm. Right. But I have a whole chapter I'll send you about why I think that. Humor can't be subsumed by art. By art. Mm -hmm. um, what about what about its progressive character, though? In other words, maybe maybe the solution to your problem is to think about which symbolic forms uh, push culture forward and which ones hold it back. And it seems to me like mm -hmm. humor, even though it can be retrogressive, almost always pushes us forward. It does. I, I agree with that. I think that that's in line with humor's function. And I was toying for a while with an idea of um, casting those things which do not perform the function as not being humor. Well, there's tremendous, um, tremendous examples of things that people once found funny mm -hmm. that people no longer find funny. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I don't mean universally exactly, but what I mean is, uh, is that. Oh no, I didn't mean to do that. That, one, that is always going to be. I'm gonna. I was gonna uh, move you to this slide. Yeah. Because this is always my closing slide. Oh yeah, please. With do my asterisk. Right, yeah. Yeah. But uh, but but the thing about it is, is it does seem to me that as culture develops, well, I remember a joke that the that John Silver Silver once told. Uh, he was Pete's Pete's teacher uh, and dean at one point uh, when you went to the University of Texas, right? Uh, John Silver was a was a Texan also and uh, uh, very much a resolute uh, UT Longhorn. And I once heard him say, "You realize what the greatest contribution of the Texas A&M Aggies was to culture?" Everybody said, well, "What?" He said, "They saved the ethnic joke." <laughs> now, is that funny? <clears throat> Well, should we be saving the ethnic joke? But embedded, I mean, he's a Kantian, so mm -hmm. was, uh, embedded in oh, the, all of Kant's jokes are terrible. Yeah, they're awful. Yeah. But embedded in that is the notion that humor pushes us, or or at least comedy does, pushes us in the direction of later finding unacceptable what we used to laugh at. And I that's true as we grow up individually, too, right? Well, in terms of humor being progressive, even the way that, you know, if we look at the way that a sense of humor develops, like psychologically in child development psychology, right, talks about, um, about how it begins in play. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, and, and progresses through all these stages. So when your kids start learning grammar, what do, what do they learn, right? They learn... Grammatic, basical grammatical rules, syntax, and at the same time they're learning animal names. 
So what do they find really, really funny for a period of their life? Puns about animals, right? Because that's how they're developing, right? And so then as that cognitive apparatus becomes more complicated, so does their sense of humor. But it begins in stuff like that, right? It begins in animal puns. And if you think about like those jokes that you, like dad jokes, something cyclical about it. Um, because dad jokes are a revisitation of the pun in a lot of ways. Um, what's what's called a dad joke, right? Um, so what's, so what's there's a something. Dad joke? A dad joke. Oh my goodness. Oh, Anybody have a back pocket? Dad joke? <laughs> Anybody have a back pocket dad joke? Well, here's here's one. This is actually my little brother's favorite joke. What's brown and sticky? A stick. <laughs> I remember what's big. That's red a broner. Red eats rocks. Mm -hmm. Big red rock eater. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that's yeah. a dad joke. So yeah. dad jokes are groners. One my dad liked to do is whenever one of us would say hey, he would say hey is for horses. Yeah. My mom would say hey is for horses. Aren't you glad you're okay? Right. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. Why is the basketball court wet? Because everyone's dribbling. No, yeah, yeah. See, we got them. We got them a lot, right? So this they're is a dad just, joke. Those are the sort of jokes that are usually met with a like the yeah. groaner jokes. Those those have become the category of dad jokes. Um, but so there's not only a progression in terms of like the way that we develop from childhood to adulthood in a sense of humor, but there's also a progression that you can see throughout cultural history, right? As culture changes, so do our forms. And so does our cultural expression. And new forms, new objects of humor are being created all the time to move along with the way that that we communicate with each other culturally. So 10 years ago, I didn't know what a meme was, right? And now memes are like a main gateway of humor dispension. Um, but I had no idea what that was. You n almost never hear someone tell a set up joke like the brown and sticky joke. That's just not how we communicate with each other. Um, so humor develops along that way. It's the same. It's the same reason why so many successful silent film actors couldn't tradition couldn't transition into the talkies, because you're a great mime or a great silent comedian, but as soon as the way of communication changes, the the way in which humor is received and accepted and developed culturally also changes. And that's why you get people who kind of end up not being able to catch up or to keep up. So I think it changes, it, there, it's a progressive form in us individually and historically, and I think that it is, if I'm right about its function, it is also trying to progress us and move us forward, but it's just as vulnerable to hijacking as any of the other forms. Uh, okay, so do, do I understand that properly from this discussion that your problem or the law that you're talking about is that you don't want to use humor as to like be critical and to say, well, this isn't humor or this like to be the judge of what is and isn't humor. Like that's the place well, that you want to avoid. Well, I, I, um, I do that actually. Well, of course, I we do all do that. that but no, you... I do that in the dissertation actually. Okay, so. Um, in terms of like, I think humor isn't properly I think an object can't pro be properly understood as an object of humor um, itself unless it's performing humor's function. Otherwise, it is an object of humor, like a joke, that's being hijacked for some other ends, like a political end. Right. So, so what was the wall that you were describing, like with those horrible meme photos? Yeah, the wall was I, that I was describing is the cultural policing. But shouldn't we just say, well, that's not humor, that's just tool of dangerous mythology or something like this. Sure, we and can just, say that. And I, but to I the other person sure. it is. To right, the, but, and that's, that's the problem, right? How many One times person's joke is another person's victimization and, right. and vice versa. Right, and that's the subjectivity that I want to get around, right? Is we, we have to get beyond so you don't want humor to, as being merely subjective or merely cultural relativism. Okay, right? so you don't want to like back away from objectivity. You I want don't to, want to back away from you objectivity. You want a strong objectivity that you I say. Want, I want a, a, an objectivity that can't be developed in my dissertation, but I'm gesturing towards it. Right. Okay? Uh, which is the way that I get myself out of Okay. Trouble. But there is this experiential problem, right? Mm -hmm. If you go back to that first meme, 
you can't say that. It, so here's here's a few, you can tell a few different stories about what's going on. With the, that um, meeting, right, the the first cop meeting with the um, the four people behind bars or whatever. Yeah. Uh, um, so so it seems like the first story you could tell about that is you could say, okay, um, that that's that's not funny. Right. Um, second story you could tell about that, right, is you shouldn't find that funny. Mm -hmm. And the third story, which I think is probably the one I, I go with and I find most interesting, is you're only going to find that funny if you buy the racist ideology of people who would find that funny, right? So yeah, it's, and, yeah. And so then we can talk about this. They sure as if. Well, I, I agree that that, yeah. that that is an as if. I have a, yeah, and I have a bunch of, uh, that I skipped analyzing that, but there's... Uh, De Souza wrote something about how you're responsible for um, finding a joke funny if it's a racist or sexist joke insofar as you have to adopt the attitude of a racist or sexist and if you adopt the attitude then you are a racist or sexist. Um, again, so we could say that someone who finds this joke funny to be a racist or a sexist or both. But does that mean that it should be um, censored. That's the law. Yeah, but that's, I think that's a question, that's sort of a, the next question. The first question you have to figure out is what's going on here phenomenologically mm -hmm. and normatively? And right. those are both really huge questions. Mm -hmm. And then it's only that you can get to the next question. It right. seems like you want to jump to that next question before you figure out the experiential and the normative dimensions of this. Because you wouldn't want to say, well, um, that's not funny because clearly people find it funny, right? Mm -hmm. So then you have to say, well, what's going on with people who find that funny? Well, what is there are also, it? and I don't know if any of you have had this experience, but I consider myself a pretty, you know, enlightened person. There are some really bad jokes that I've heard that I find hysterical and then I feel guilty for laughing at them. Um, I would still, I can, I would still consider them funny. I don't think that I am someone who advocates domestic violence, but I've heard a pretty funny domestic violence show. I think that's what makes something like Cards Against Humanity so successful, is because yeah. it allows people that's exactly to right. be that right. example is homophobic and private amongst safe company that mm -hmm. understands you don't live your life as a generally racist, sexist, mm -hmm. homophobic, disabled person, and but you still understand the humor, mm -hmm. perhaps. Which again is then, then what is it, right? What is it that we're recognizing? And, and um, it's anonymous too, because you're not the one that said it. The cards say it. You just kind yeah. of like let the cards. This is how the, I'm playing the game. I'm not saying this. Game. This is just happening. Maybe this is a Cards Against Humanity chapter. <laughs> <laughs> well, and this is something that that um, that Pete suggested earlier today. That's I mean absolutely spot on. You want to get. You, you want to hold people accountable for producing stuff like this, get rid of internet anonymity, right? If you take the hoods off and you see who's under the white sheets, right? Then all of a sudden people aren't as brave. However, you don't want it to, again, you don't want it to evolve into, you know, a red scare. I wonder if you uh, 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 find this similar dumbing down thing in political correctness. That's exactly what I'm saying. That's yeah. exactly that's exactly the overcorrection that I'm talking about. Yeah. Right? I mean, because it gets to be just a dull, flat blanket of don't say anything. Right, right. There are um I teach at a Catholic uh, Jesuit school um, and I teach mostly affluent white students. And I am a poor kid who grew up in Section 8 housing, who is just now at a place with the university in the title for, first, for the first time. And um, I have to really, I'm learning, that I have to be very careful about what I say, even when I know I'm saying something controversial for the sake of philosophy, right? So. I have had students complain both about my daring to teach um, Rawls, who apparently, I don't know if you guys knew this, is a communist, according to my students. 
So I've, I've had students complain. I don't think so. Uh, socialist, yes. They're, well, that's the thing. Randy, they're the same thing. <laughs> oh, I see. Um, so, I've, so I've had students complain about that, and students complain about uh, me teaching Ayn Rand, um, while at the same time saying that I am uh, too politically liberal because I tell them that there is such a thing as truth. Um, You're too liberal because you do believe in truth. Yes. Yeah. Because I argue against. I, uh, I spend. I spend time in my ethics class, right? Arguing, arguing against, against subjectivism and cultural relativism. And if I, if someone hands in a paper that says, you know, well, it's just my opinion that you shouldn't torture a baby, but to each his own, and they're supposed to be giving me the deontological position, I make them wrong. It's because. Don't be fooled. That's how Trump got elected. Right, yes, it's the relativism. It's it's yeah. the variety of relativism that mm -hmm. allowed him to get a, a plurality of voices. Conservatism right. is not something that believes in truth anymore. Anyway. Oh, well, I, so I this is, not. but this is what I'm saying, right? It in, it doesn't matter what I'm talking about philosophically. What's going on right now is so politically charged that I am at the same time both too liberal and too conservative to be in the classroom, according to some of my students. Not a lot of them, usually just one. And there haven't been any blog posts about it, but there will be conversations in an office, right? Um, so, and a, a lot of my colleagues, and I, I feel like I escape that line pretty well, but co my colleagues have not been as lucky, right? Um, it's, it's, everything is so politically charged. And I don't wanna tell my students that things aren't, right? They should be thinking about their opinions and their and their lives in terms of the policies and politics that govern those lives that create or destroy opportunities, right? But truth is still truth. But there are things that we all know. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I can't believe I'm saying this. There are things that we all know you shouldn't do. Like for example, right. you shouldn't mock your own students. Right. Uh, and and nor should you sit by idly while they mock one another. So there's a norm. I mean, it, 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 even the politically correct and the politically incorrect mm -hmm. can agree that mocking one another in an educational environment is not acceptable. Right. So even if you want to be aggressively politically incorrect, you say, yeah, 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 but come on. So, you know, somebody comes in and, you know, they got a disability, you don't. Right. You, you, you don't. What if you, mock, what if, what if you stop somebody from mocking a Trump supporter in class? And then that suddenly makes you like a regressive, right? Yeah, I would, person. I, I would stop them. From well, I would too. Him. But then that that would that would suddenly give them the impression that maybe you're a Trump supporter too. And and then it it becomes politically charged already. It's it's a polarity that once right. you once you protect one side, which you protect the you know the dignity of one side, you're. Uh, supposedly then denying the dignity of the other side, right? And it's, it's stupid thinking, right? When we get this political, it's stupid. Well, and that's why I think that, um, and this is what, uh, part of what Jerry and I, okay, part of what, do you, should we watch one more time? This is part of, one of the reasons, one of the things that I'm gonna talk about in the seminar with Jared, right, is, is the way that I think, is the way that I connect the stuff on Kassir and humor to the way I think philosophers need to be more engaged in the public. Um, and the responsibility and the role that we have as teachers and as philosophers to uh, get back in there and to stop being scared off by the highly politicized nature of it. At the same time, that puts, puts us at a great risk, right? Yeah, Jared? Uh, okay, so I don't know necessarily if this will help you with uh, your wall or anything like this, but the one thing that like, I noticed that when I'm uh, the way that I would approach it, I guess, if I were in your situation and struggling to over, you know, overcome this kind of thing, is that I noticed that the way that you talked about humor as a symbolic form, mm -hmm. um, and I forget like the exact definition, but something like, um, you know, tearing apart epistemic vice or something. I forget. Right, that. disrupting. Disrupting. So, so exactly. yeah, kind of like a, a catalyst out of the natural attitude. Right. You want to use like a Australian So person. what's interesting about that? way of thinking about the problem for me is that it's kind of negative. Do you know what I mean? Like right. not, but in, in not the sense Not encouraging that, epistemic virtue, just- Or something like that. Yeah. In, in the sense that it takes culture 
it's sort of metacultural, is mm -hmm. it, that it, it posits humor as something that comments on culture or disrupts culture and so forth and so on, but isn't actually creating a kind of culture or participating in the creation of culture. Yeah, that's not the impression I want to give. No, uh, yeah. and, and so I've told you before that I, I'm interested in the idea of humor as a symbolic form of culture, like mm -hmm. I think there's something interesting about that. But, um, so all I guess I'm saying is that maybe instead of talking about humor in that form, like a negative form of like, oh, that it's taking something apart or it's anti-opposition, what is the actual positive articulation of humor as a symbolic form? So mm -hmm. when I'm being humorous, what kind of culture am I creating? Mm -hmm. what, what is the actual product that comes out of that? Not like destroying something that already exists or tearing it apart or being anti, but what is the actual positive statement? It's not that the anti and the negative statement isn't there, it's just, mm -hmm. but it's a different orientation on, on yeah. humor. Yeah. And so maybe I think coming it's implicitly, at it, I think it's implicitly kind of there already. What I don't yeah. want to say is that humor always encourages epistemic virtue. No, no. And right, because that's too strong exactly. of a statement. What I do want to say is what humor is, is like a get woke moment, even if it's about something silly. So like even if it's about you know Seinfeld talking about what's the deal with airline food, right? It's not like we never heard about airline food before. We just got so comfortable with it, right? It's just such an ordinary part of our experience that we don't give it a second thought. So humor can is just kind of like, you know, we can think of it in terms of the problem of induction too, right? I get so used to one cause having an effect over and over and over again. I don't notice that I take for granted cause and effect until I flip the switch and the light doesn't turn on. Right. So humor could be the light switch not turning on, right? That makes us kind of stop and be like, oh yeah, okay, now I have to, now I see a problem and now I gotta figure out a solution. Right. I think humor can help us see a problem, not even necessarily as like a socio-political problem. It could just be a problem of like, oh, I didn't realize that dogs were funny. Well, so is humor always corrective? Is it always something that comes in and I like feel like it's always directive. It's always directing our attention towards something. Which is why sometimes, which is why even those stupid puns we groan because we're like, yeah, I see it, but that's dumb. Right. Right. I like that, the way you say that, because it, it shows that humor has a perspective, right? And mm -hmm. that's a positive way of, that, and again, positive in the sense of it says something about humor itself, not as anti something else. Yeah. So all, all, all I'm, all, I guess all I'm thinking is that maybe if you focus more on these kinds of positive statements mm -hmm. about humor, like what is humor actually producing? What is humor itself? Not like as a means of disrupting other culture, but what does it put into the world? So maybe that would change your perspective and yeah, help, like, help well, you think suppose through. Suppose it was just a way of loosening people up and making them relax. Uh, well, that, that would be it, positive. I suppose so, but it's all it's positive in the like an emotionally positive, but it's negative logically speaking in that it's always like reactive to something that's already And I also well, don't but, want to but reduce it isn't humor just to negative that. because it's pointing out something that's true. And if it isn't if humor doesn't have or or satire or wit don't have anything true in them, they become mere whimsy. They don't matter, you can't laugh. Sure. But I think too, and this might relate to what you're saying about the sort of the positive, non-critical dimension. Of yeah, humor. talking about what it produces in the well, world or, instead of what it right. uh, disrupts. It, and I, I keep going back to that cop meme because what's interesting about it for me is that it reinforces, I yeah. assume, it reinforces, oh, we're part of this group, right? right. We Absolutely. find this funny Absolutely. and we see the way that things really are. Yeah. Right? That's, right. that's, the, that's probably what I'd be telling myself about how it's part, part of the, right? it's So it's part, part of this yeah. sort of, it reinforces this identity right that right and that's what point. that's what cultural artifacts do right? right they they create but also reflect and reproduce culture and that's what makes all humor such a slippery thing because it is disruptive exactly. and critical mm -hmm. but it also reinforces the beliefs in the community right. The, right and if you don't laugh at that it's because you're snowflake right humor one thing that humor creates is community mm -hmm. right i mean yeah. that's what we say one way or another well, well yeah creating it in that group so it, yeah. it creates a connection between me and you that says we are the same, mm -hmm. we have a, we have yeah. ties, and so that's one, so that would be one way of saying, like a positive, right. so that humor creates community or something like that. one of the that. very few, like, agreed upon things, like, things that people agree with about humor is that it does all of these things, and yet we don't have any sort of theory that can explain why it does all that stuff, 
and why it's still so persistent in culture. That's where I think Kassir can come in and help. He ties all this stuff together. Yeah. Then even if you, like, so if that's the extent of it, though we say, like, humor creates community or something like that, it probably still leaves you in the same ethical position that you're in because all we're saying is, well, humor's done its job, its function to create a community, mm -hmm. then we're left at <clears throat> having to judge this community and say, right. well, this is a bad community. Right, that's where I think the, the Apia uh, stuff and the Rohinger as if stuff comes in with the to what end question, right? To what end, what is the ideal? What is, what is the normative world in which you're positing? Um, but then again, well, well, what do you do about it, right? Even if, even if we are able to get to an objective statement of this is bad, this is halting our struggle towards liberation, right? Well, what do you do? How does culture correct itself? What we're doing now isn't working. Right. What Jerry Seinfeld says about this, he's got an entire routine, I'm sure you've seen it, about how, how stand-up comedy in particular actually works. He says it's all analogical. He says you take any two things and you, and you ask yourself how are these things alike or how are they different, uh, and then you imagine a connection. How is a philosophy lecture like a stand-up base? Mm -hmm. uh, they both look pretty good as an idea, but as soon as you start, you realize you should have left it in the corner. Or, or uh, whatever. I mean, the, or how is it like a grandfather clock? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, the point is put two base terms in there, mm -hmm. and then you can create a whole Seinfeld episode, not out of how they're alike, but out of how they seem to be alike, but then mm -hmm. you twist it five, six, seven right. times yeah, to show, how they're, show how they're actually different. And he says that, that it's an imaginative construction, mm -hmm. and you can start anywhere as long as you have at least two things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> and, an incongruity theory. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and a yeah. lot of and a lot of comedians start that way. One of my favorite. So, but you can't. It's hard. It's tough to use an incongruity theory on someone like Steve Martin who has a bachelor's degree in philosophy, and he started writing anti-jokes by following Lewis Carroll's logic book. The guy who wrote Alice in Wonderland wrote a logic textbook. And if you read the logic exercises, they are hysterical because they're nonsense, right? And so that's how Steve Martin started writing his jokes when he was really, really early in his stand-up career. And again, incongruity, why did we laugh again at the baby? Right? That, that, I was going to say, that, that you were asking the right question there, I think. Uh, we know what's going to happen. Right. And, yeah. and then the Afro Ninja, I mean, it gets funnier the second time. I imagine mm -hmm. it's even funnier the third time. <laughs> we can find out that, if right? we want. Yeah. Um, part of the aspect of a symbolic form is that it's moving from possibility to actuality. Mm -hmm. Right? And uh, the actuality, well, okay, let me give you an example. When you showed the car sticker thing, right. I totally read it a different way when you first showed it. I yeah, chuckled I thinking it was saying something. I thought it was maybe she's married to a guy in prison and that's his family tree or something. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, it, it wasn't readily obvious what was being said here, right? And then I looked at it again, and then and then you said, yeah, oh, this you, is just a bunch of things. Yeah, if you try to look at it from a law enforcement oh, perspective. It wasn't even from a law enforcement yeah, perspective. It was unusual. just from a, a right. I was just looking at it going, what am I seeing here? Uh, there were all kinds of possibilities in the way mm -hmm. it's arranged and, and right. what's being presented. Now, uh, one kind of actuality is being presented now is this is the the, the baby mama and the, and the welfare situation and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, but there are still possibilities present, right. Right? right? There's an emergent reality. It's not just a reality has been presented to us. Mm -hmm. There's an emergent reality that still has many possibilities right. arranged with it. So you see the baby tip over. And I mean, I was waiting, is it done? Is, it, is, it, is there just a pause? Is the baby about to get back up? I mean, what's gonna happen? And then I realized the video was over and I was just sitting there on the edge of my seat waiting. Yeah. Right. So well, okay. So then, does it? Does the baby suddenly do a yoga move? I mean, there are all <laughs> kinds of things. Like, the possibilities are still there. We've narrowed down some of the possibilities. Baby's not going to slip on the ice like we all expected, or, or fall through in a surprisingly deep hole or something. Uh, but the tip over is like, okay, right. You know, I mean, who hasn't done that at least once in their life in some slow motion fall or something? But then the story continues, and that's why it remains to be funny. Because there are still all these possibilities rattling up. You know, oh my gosh, it could be this. Could be. And you see it again. It's like you think of other possibilities of what could have happened, 
that didn't, but still arranged in the way that it does happen, you could still see it there mm -hmm. uh, in, in some kind of a, a, an emergent way that is not just done, right? It's not a done deal. And those other two memes with the, the Trump stuff, I yeah. still don't get which side they were from. I mean, I honestly looked at them and I, it could go either way. I could imagine yeah. it being from either side. Yeah, it's a... Uh... When people start talking past each other and politics and things, they're usually saying the same thing in both directions. And so right. uh, they, they begin to look a lot alike on both right. sides. And, and that's so, why I, kept, I pulled all of these specifically from that cop humor page, because I feel like the context in which it's presented and for the audience that it's presented, and I have also um, uh, their, their about us or our story thing, that I'm not gonna read because it's too long, but it's basically saying like, look, we deal with the like the bowels of humanity and we need to, yeah, we need to laugh. We need to be able to laugh, right? And so, you know, in big bold letters, it says like something, if you're easily offended, this page is not for you. Um, you know, we need to be able to laugh or we can't do our job, stuff like that. But that's an existential or a relief theory of humor that they're using, right? And that's what a lot of comedians use, like when Daniel Tosh got in trouble for his rape jokes. That's what he used too, right? Jim Norton famously has a um, has a really really good interview with a uh, feminist comedian named Lindy West on a now non-existent show called uh, Totally Biased, but you can still find it online. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a great debate between the two of them, which is how I think most of these conversations should happen in debate style. Um, but it's just a relief theory of humor, and it, it's it's uh, is it good for for, um, is it, sure, it might get, you might get a laugh, right? Because you see the worst of the worst, right? But is it good to reproduce and encourage the sort of, um, the sort of complacency with that ideal of us and then dehumanization that this is doing, right? Well, unfortunately, I mean, democracy is hard, right? And then the one yeah. thing that people forget is that um, you have to share space with people you disagree with. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it seems like uh, Facebook is making people really, really, really intolerant of difference. Even the oh, people yeah. who purport to support difference. Oh, yeah. Right? And, and so like, I uh, can't like, stand democracy is a shared people. space with more than two opinions, right? And to suggest that there's just one side or the other is, is, is mm -hmm. a complete fiction to begin with. Right. And that's what allows us to demonize each other, right? Mm -hmm. We have to be able to laugh at ourselves, so we don't. Right, uh, that's right. and the last, thing, the last thing that you will find on this page is a, a, a meme that's making fun of a cop. Yeah, I was gonna say the best part of that is under absolutely no circumstances will comments insulting or degrading law enforcement professionals be tolerated on this Facebook page. Yeah. <laughs> what irony. Right, exactly, right? It should be, yeah, they so should say, say, we have that. our own page where you can post your own stuff about us, right? And they can laugh at themselves because part of the problem, what makes humor mean, mm -hmm. is now you, 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 you're targeting a person, separating them from the group. Right, uh, right. And, and when it becomes a majority versus a minority, then you're no longer really practicing democracy at that point, are you? That's tyranny. Well, and there's and also so, the, when, when the dehumanization through humor gets so far as to create a, you know, it's not even an us and them, it's an us and those, right? Like, the, the creating the monsters out of the... They, they aren't the, even really Americans. Right. I have good, uh, a couple of good friends who are conservative, I mean, very conservative, arch conservative, mm -hmm. uh, military men. And uh, the things that they say just blow my mind some days like yeah. you know people shouldn't be allowed to vote unless they've served their country right i've also and i've also heard the you know like i'm gonna get my gun and pick off you know yeah but i'm gonna stand at the, the border and shoot people who try and cross it at type the of same attitude. time i hear people on the lap talking oh, about yeah. oh yeah talking right. about if how I shoot donald trump you know, or wood or the whole whatever, basket though. of deplorables thing yeah exactly right. yeah, i mean exactly it's going right. both ways and that's the problem that's that's, that's more of the facebook. wall stuff yes, right when donald trump got elected i quit on facebook because what was happening uh was just so clearly anti-democratic, I just couldn't do it anymore. I was telling Corey this yesterday. Yeah. Uh, I, it's just, uh, it, people have become so intolerant of difference that they can't even allow themselves 
to laugh at themselves in the course of a joke, right? I mean, because jokes can be revealing, even by somebody who hates you. If I you think, can laugh I at it, you're like, you know, always that's, something there's always the something joke. there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, even if it's just this is what this person finds funny, yeah, you're, you're, right. You're it, it says a whole lot about that you're person. So something. that doesn't say anything about me. That says mm-hmm. something about you. Mm-hmm. But I mean, that should be part of the conversation. Not mm-hmm. oh yeah, well fuck you. You know, mm-hmm. you 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 deplorable or whatever. Right. Right. That's right. that's not a funny comeback, right. <laughs> right? And then you get into these smaller and smaller communities with with inside jokes about the other side, right? And then you you're building a straw man out of a human being. And then you can say and do whatever you want to them, right? Because what happens if you so so the the cop memes and you know this one that I these ones that I don't like, right? The the whole idea is if I can make you something less than a moral subject, then there's nothing wrong with treating you without moral consideration. Yeah. Yeah. So when you have people in positions of power, right, and they trade and encourage a culture of that sort of humor, then moral consideration goes out the window. And I'm, I live in Milwaukee, right? I live in, in Sheriff Clark's, well, I think he's done now. But there are four people in 2017 that died in prison because they were denied water or medical treatment. Um, so like one, a person dehydrated to death in his prison. Why? Because, oh, they're just a criminal. They're complaining. They don't really need water. They're just complaining, right? And if you get a culture, the humor does something to people, right? And it's more than just an incongruity, it's more than just a relief. That's my that's that's what I, I that's why I needed Kasira's symbolic forms to kind of make to give humor its due, right? It needs to be understood as as important as it is. And um and when you get these culture, the, these humor communities of dehumanization, you end up with stuff like that suddenly being okay, and it's gradual, right? It doesn't happen all at once. But if you, even if you just trace the the history of Jewish jokes before the Nazis ended up in power, it, they were jokes at first. They were dehumanizing, dehumanizing, dehumanizing. Then it was all propaganda of fear, right? Now that we've made them monsters and not humans. Right? Then it's a propaganda of fear, and now look what's, what we can do. Right? And the same thing happens on the left, on the right, politically all the time. Um, so that, that's the real danger that Kassir is pointing out, and that's, that's where my wall comes from. Right? Is well, okay, even if we can find an, obje- an objective standard with the as if idealization, what do we do about it? And I have no idea. I have no idea. Well, what about a possible objection that goes? Humor is just a tool, it's a means, it's a vehicle, use whatever you want. But, and, and one of the ways that humor, humor can be used is to dehumanize. Mm-hmm. So, but it's one of many ways that people can right. be dehumanized. Right, right, right. So what no, we should it doesn't really, have a, it doesn't have the, uh, the... Right, so here's the problem. What we should really be worried about is the dehumanization and not the humor, right? Because humor is just one of many possible ways that dehumanization can occur. See, I don't agree with that, though, because the way, the reason that humor gets away with it is because you always have that built-in excuse of it's just a joke, right? If you say it in the context of a joke, if you say it on a comedy show, if you say it in a comedy club, if you say it in conversation laughing with your friends, right? You get a free pass. And that's why it's insidious. That's why humor, I think, is a much more powerful tool of dehumanization than these other tools because those ones aren't, as good as hiding what it is, right? Like, talk about a Trojan horse. Humor is a great one. Like, and it is, it's, um, humor's, humor can be a tool for a lot of things. I use it pedagogically all the time, right? Um, and one of the reasons that it works in the classroom is because they don't realize that they're learning a thing. And that's why, that's what, so yeah, dehumanization, yes, that's the problem, but we gotta pay attention to the role that humor plays in it, I think. Well, we probably ought to take this up in, with pizza and uh, uh, continuing informal conversation. That leads to a seminar at 6.30, but thank you, Jennifer, for thank your you.